I'm glad you're all here. Last week, I was very excited because we had Global Church Sunday. Uh, if you came to Global Church Sunday, you were probably extremely blessed because it was amazing. It was such a great time. The morning was a great. The afternoon, some families, we all got together, got to hang out. That was super fun. And the weather, it's like the Lord said, yes, I'll bless you with good weather today. So it was a great time. Then we had our Global Encounter Night, and it was amazing. Another part was so good. Just, just getting to lean in and kind of tap into the Lord's heart and what he's trying to do in the world is a really important thing to do. Just God what are you doing? Um, and so like, we want to partner with him in that. And so that was a very exciting day for us. And so now we're in a new series. So we're starting a new series today on the book of James. Okay. We're going to read through the new Testament book of James. It's going to take us about 12 weeks. So it's going to take us through the summertime. So now y'all got quiet. Some of y'all have actually read James, right? Like you're like, this is an intense book, all right? There's a reason for it. We want to go through the book of James. Here's what I'd encourage you to do. Get a journal, get some paper, bring a pen, a highlighter, bring your Bible, bring what you need to bring because our goal and our aim in this process to preach the book of James is that it will actually change the way that you live your life. Okay, we want it to change you. Uh, we, we do this specifically, we will take a book of the Bible and go through it so that we can actually cover word for word every single piece in a, in a context. Now, you can't go through the entire Bible uh, in one year going line by line. That'd probably take way too long just to actually even read it all in front. So we try to do topical. We try to do um, exegetical and go straight through a book of the Bible. We'll, we'll preach whatever we can preach to help you get, uh, get your life changed, get to know Jesus, whatever it takes, okay? Now, when we go through a book like this, though, you have to realize that the book of James and the Bible as a whole is actually considered meditation literature. That means whenever we read the Bible, your, your whole purpose and aim is to take the scripture and to like meditate on what is being said. And so you want to study the scriptures. You want to lean into the scriptures. You want to read a same verse over and over again. You, you know, like today when we're doing worship, how many of you realize we actually repeated a line over and over and over again? right? Now, how many of you thought we were, something happened and they just got stuck and the slides didn't change? And like, we'll just keep singing until like, you know, until they figure out the slide. That's not what happened. We will actually sing a slide or, or a phrase over and over and over again, because we want you to get it. We want to meditate and to think and to wrestle on that particular text. Just, did you know this happens in the Bible? Do you know there's angels around the throne room of heaven right now singing, holy, holy, holy. And Jesus is like, Hey, when are y'all going to get a new verse? You know, it's like, so we come to church and sometimes we're going to repeat a line because we're hoping that we can collectively grab hold of the words that are being said. Man, that last song was so poetic. Man, it just makes you want to just sing it over and over so you can get every piece of it in your system. But that's the same with the Bible. If you've ever read through the Bible, you didn't go like, nailed it. You just set it down on the book. Go like, I read it all. You're like, no, no, I probably should read that again and then again and then again and again. It's meant to be meditated on. Now, I'm not talking about yoga. You know, I'm talking about like reading the scripture, putting it into your mind and thinking about it all day long, going to somebody else and say, hey, did you read that scripture? What did that mean to you? Man, I had different circumstances and now the word jumped out in a whole new way. If you've ever been reading the Bible and something jumped out at you, it's because the Holy Spirit made the word alive for you. So that's what we want. So we want to read it and think about it. We want to understand it to the best of our abilities. We want to talk about the text in community. Did you know that's why we're here in community so that we can read text together and we can go and we can walk this out with each other and talk to each other about this. That's why we have groups so that you can actually get with other people throughout the week and talk about what's going on. If we don't have groups, it may be available at the time because it's like summer, do whatever it takes to find people around you just to talk to them about it. The other part is we want to share what we know. Hey, here's what we know about the scripture. Here's what we know about the history and the context. And we want to take what's read in part and bring it into the whole. In other words, when you read the book of James, you have to also keep in your mind and in your heart the entirety of scripture. Okay, so you got to do all that. And then we want to ultimately take the word of God and apply it to our lives. It will do you no good if you know the Bible, but have never actually applied it to your life. No good. So what we're going to do is I'm going to start off. We're going to read, or I'm going to read to you the text. But in honor of God's word, I think we should stand up today. I think we're going to stand up. I'm going to read the word of God over you. We're going to be in James chapter one. We're going to go through verses one through eight. So I'm going to read it. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. 
If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So Holy Spirit, we pray today that you would allow for your word to come alive in our lives. Open up our hearts, our minds, so that we see where you are. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, have a seat. So it was about a week or so ago that I decided to take Erica out to eat for lunch. As some of you know, a couple of weeks ago, she was in the hospital for a couple of days. And so I thought, you know, hospital food, forget that mess. I'm going to take you out, you know? So I took her to the square. Have you ever been to the uh, square and eaten at the uh, Fire Oak Grill? You know? I was like, baby, we're stepping up. It ain't Whataburger today, all right? You can get the good stuff, you know? So we go there, and we're walking up. And as any good husband does, I, I kind of got ahead of her, and I grabbed the door. You know, and these are like, you know those old doors, you know, downtown's cool, the history and stuff? I almost ruined it. I grabbed that sucker and was trying to just pry the door open, and it was actually a push situation. And I knew very quickly because the hostess is like, because the bottom of it was great. It's just the top got jammed. I was like, no, I'm going to fix this. You know, I was like, I'm going to just rip that thing right off the door. And you know, sadly, Erica is just standing there watching the whole thing go down. But the problem was they didn't have a sign. You know, some doors actually say push or pull. This one didn't. So I just run up there and just grab hold of it. If I had slowed down just long enough, I would have looked at the door and realized I'm supposed to just pull the door open. Instead, I just try to shove it down. Here's the problem. In life, Every time we come up to a door, we all tend to do the same thing. We don't look for anything to tell us how to get it through. We just run up, grab hold of that handle, and think we're going to rip that door off. And when if it's not working, we don't care. We just try harder. Your door's broken. No, sir. You're supposed to pull, not push, you know? And that, I say this because the book of James has 54 direct commands for your life. And if we don't stop and read these direct commands from the word of God in our life, we're going to run up to every single door and see if we can just rip that thing right off. When if we'd slow down and just study the word of God, he'll tell you how to go through. You don't have to struggle anymore. He'll tell us. And so that's the part that I'm very excited about as we go through the book of James is that God is gonna be speaking to you in your life right now today how to live out your life. So I wanna start. We're gonna go to the very first verse in chapter one. Now, how many of you, when you read the first verse, uh, when you're in the midst of like reading through the gospels or really it's through the, uh, the letters, you tend to just gloss over the very first verse because it, it reads like this. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. You go like, cool, got that out of the way. Let's move on. Here's what I wanna do. We actually need to stop and look at what he's saying here because it sets up the entire letter. There are things about the very beginning words of this letter where James is leaning into it. It's hopefully gonna help you open up your eyes a little bit to understand maybe James just a little bit differently. So he starts off and he says that his name is James. That's great. Now we know who wrote it, right? It's not like a mystery, like somebody wrote this letter to you. You know, it's like just sending it out there. No, we know it's James. And he says, first of all, that he is a servant of God. Now, hopefully, if you're going to read a letter from somebody in the Bible, they're going to say, I'm a servant of the Lord, right? That's what we would expect. But the next, he adds on to this, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's something really important about this. So first of all, when you say he, Jesus is Lord, you are ascribing to him the divinity that he deserves. He is God. He is God in the flesh. His name is Jesus. And so you look at the next piece, the Lord Jesus, it's his name. That he in the flesh, being a human, when he came, he came in the flesh for us and he walked this out. And then he adds Christ. In the Greek, it's the anointed one. So fully God, fully man. Look at the complexity of that. Now, here's the part that maybe you didn't quite know is that James was actually the half-brother of Jesus. He grew up with Jesus in the household. How many of you have ever had siblings? Anybody in here got siblings? Now, how many of you had those siblings and you thought, mm -mm, you think you're Jesus, but you ain't? <laughs> James literally could say that. And James was actually a skeptic who turned believer after the death, burial, and resurrection. Now, that's pretty powerful. He didn't just say, hi, my name is James. I'm the half-brother of Jesus, so I get a special seat at the table. No, he said, my name is James and I am a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't try to take any kind of position at the table, even though he had some sort of family relationship there. I think that's powerful when you realize his humility. That's pretty hard to do when you got that sibling, isn't it? 
I hope mine's not watching, you know? <laughs> but why is this important? You see, James grew up with Jesus. And so many of us with siblings, I think that we can get into that place where, you know, if you think about James and how he lived his life, can you imagine living your life as James, living in the household, hearing all the stories about it? Can you imagine a family reunion? James, what'd you do? Well, I got a new job. It's cool. Jesus, what'd you do? I healed thousands. Like, pfft. you know, it's like, great. He's coming back for Thanksgiving, you know? But can you imagine, honestly, like, think about the fact that he had to deal with Jesus was his brother. Could you imagine now, once he accepted faith, once he took on faith in Jesus, how he may have felt like he missed it? That for three and a half years of Jesus' earthly ministry, like when Jesus fully stepped in, he was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan, and the next three and a half years, all of a sudden, Jesus doing miracles after miracles and preaching and proclaiming, and James is just sitting at home. I don't believe that. I can imagine as so many of us, have you, have you ever felt like you've missed it? Like, I wasted and I squandered years. Man, if I would have only leaned in, if I would have only invested some time in this, man, if I, if I could have done that, here's what I want you to know is that, that James did not allow for that disappointment and the what ifs of life to hold him back. He was able to get over it very quickly because as you'll see, he was able to move into his calling. He laid that down and said, I'm gonna step into what God's called me to do. And he now is one of the leaders of the Jew, uh, Jewish church. Like he was in Jerusalem, like leading part of that church. It was, he's pretty influential. And it's because he was willing to just not look at all the... What ifs? How many of you get stuck in, man, if this would have happened, but you never make a plan for today? I want, to, I want you to hear this. If you hear anything else, hear this one maybe right now, which is this. Don't let disappointment keep you from your calling. I don't care how old or how young you are, no matter how many times you think you have missed your calling, God has a plan and a purpose for your life. If you were in this room, he has a plan for you and a purpose for you, and you didn't miss anything. You know, people date the, the letter itself around 44 to 49 AD. Jesus actually died around 30 AD. So you can see here that about 15 years after the death of Jesus and his resurrection, James, who's now a believer, wrote this letter. 15 year turnaround. That's a pretty big deal to be leading out. James even goes on, he dies for his faith around 62 AD. That's a pretty substantial faith in a sibling. And for us, when we read this text and we look at how he's, he's ascribing to the Lord Jesus Christ, like I'm a servant to him and all that he was able to accomplish and, and getting past the what ifs, that is a beautiful place to stand. Now the verse continues and then he goes on, he says this, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Now this word scattered is really important. He, he uses this uh, diaspora, which means this, to scatter about or to sow over. It's, it's a scattering of the people, of all the, all the 12 tribes of Israel. In other words, he's saying, hey, all the Christians, all the people who have been scattered among this world, I want you to pay attention to what I'm about to write to you. And I think it's interesting, this word, he, he writes this letter, and I think so many of us, we have to realize that we are also part of the scattered. Do you realize that? Like, our home should really be in Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be with him, but he left you here for a reason. Have you ever thought about that, that God has you here for a reason and for a purpose? The kingdom of God needs to be invested. It needs to be sown into in this world so others can come to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And so he has you scattered among this world for a purpose and for a plan. We are part of the scattering, a part of those who are sown over the world. And if Jesus is sowing into the world, that should mean you have to understand your place in it. What is my purpose? What is my plan? Because unless the seed is sown, there is no harvest. But seeds have to be sown and scattered in order to grow. Goes on in verse two. Let's pick up there. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, before we get into this too much, right there, you immediately just lost. You just, I'm out. How many of you have ever faced a trial of any kind? How many of you have faced some extremely difficult trials of many kinds? Okay. And if you didn't raise your hand, it's because you're in such a trial now that you couldn't even muster up the energy to lift your hand. When you read in the Bible, it says, consider it pure joy to suffer in the trial. You're like, I'm out. There's no joy to be had in that. 
What I want to do before we go into it too far is just stop for a moment, allow for ourselves to meditate on the scripture and realize our place again. Right there, that word scattering, I'm going right back there. You were sprinkled as seeds into this earth so that the harvest could be ripe, so that the world could see the kingdom of God. So now the very next verse comes into this, consider it pure joy. Now that word pure actually is just kind of an all-encompassing word that means consider it all joy. So consider it all joy when you begin to face a trial of any kind. Why? Because the Lord has a plan for you and a purpose for you. He holds your destiny. Do you believe that? For some of you, you're still searching out your destiny and you're continuing to wrestle with the what ifs. You're in a trial. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So already here, we realize that there is, there's something that is coming from my enduring and finding joy in the midst of a trial. It's supposed to produce something in you. The Passion Translation says it this way. My fellow believers, when it seems as though you're facing nothing but difficulties, See it as an invaluable opportunity to experience the greatest joy that you can. Now that one seems to settle in a little bit cleaner, doesn't it? In the midst of a difficulty. How many of you have ever, you feel like you're in a current difficulty? Anybody in the room? No, lift your hands up. Come on, let's just put them up. I want you to look around now. If you're in a current difficulty of facing a trial of any kind, that's how many of us, this is like the vast majority of us. How many of you know if you didn't raise your hand, you're like, "Uh uh-oh, one's coming. You know, like any day now. But that seems like all of us. Now, how many of you can also say that you can believe you can experience great joy in that trial? Now, if you raised your hand or if you're waving to me, that means you've been through one before and you've learned a few things. But here's what I've learned to realize with many others talking in between services. It's the hard part is when you're in the midst of the trial. When you get on the other side of a trial, you're like, whoo. You ever been on the other side of one and you thought, man, I'm a better person for what I had to endure and go through there. And some of y'all look back on that trial and you go like, can I get a do-over? You know, like I didn't do it exactly well. Don't worry, another trial will come. But it's true. Hindsight and your perspective is a beautiful, play, beautiful thing to have. And if you can carry that over so that the next time you endure another trial, you'll begin to realize, I think I know why I'm here. That word translated trial is parasimos, and it has two basic meanings. The first one is an inner enticement of sin. Remember, he said trials of various and many kinds, right? So the first one he's really, that we have to look at is this inner struggle of sin. It's in 1 Timothy 6, 9, uh, he, he, Paul refers to it as a foolish and harmful desires that trap. Now, how many of you have seen siblings, since we've talked about siblings, fall into foolish traps, huh? Yeah, you're, you're sitting next to them, aren't you? Y'all got quiet again. How many of you as a sibling have fallen into a foolish trap? Your sibling said, don't do that. It's a foolish trap. When we step into sin, it's a trap. One of the biggest traps in the world today that I've seen, because I have to deal with it all the time, I talk to people about this all the time, is pornography. The world loves to just shove it in our faces in different ways of different kinds, and it traps people in a sin. And we struggle and we wrestle with it. And the the difficult part about pornography, and I'm just going to talk about it because we should, right? Is that shame gets so attached to people who deal with pornography. But there is no shame or condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So why do we continue to sit in the shame? It's because the enemy has designed a trap for you. But it's not just, it's not just, you know, pornography. There's anger. There's lies. There's hate. There's pride. But there's also apathy and laziness and even fear. And these are those inner struggles with sin that so easily ensnare and trap us. And we have to like look in our own lives and be able to catch those. And then there's the other one, which is external affliction. That's the other part of the trials that we look at, the external ones. In 1 Peter 4.12, he calls them fiery ordeals that test us. I love that, fiery ordeals. Not just like, hey, you know those things that just happen? No, these are fiery. These are get after you. Yeah, I don't like any of these. Things like this, like, have you ever thought of a fiery ordeal is wealth? Like having too much money, you're like, uh-oh, I got a struggle here because I, you know, I just appease my flesh with my own finances and I don't need God. 
or maybe it's poverty. I'm in such a dire strait that I'm broke that God's left me here. You see, in both richness and poorness, we blame God for either one of them or we leave God out of it or we just move away and we just, we don't allow for God to speak into those circumstances in our lives. Maybe accusations where people accuse you of something. I know that many of us have been accused of things we never did and those feel like a fiery ordeal in our life. But even your own health, your physical health, dealing with death or dealing with other people, they feel like fiery ordeals. And these are the kinds of afflictions as well as people who will speak out against you because of your faith. That one's a hard one. You ever try to share the gospel with somebody at work and they call you names and make fun of you? That feels like it hurts. Thankfully, we're not living in a country where we're gonna die for our faith. There's people all over the world globally who will literally be dying for their faith. And yet they still feel like a fiery ordeal to us to be made fun of to read your Bible in the workplace. Consider it all joy. But let's get into what I mean by that. In the NASB, the New American Standard, it says, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces, and they use the word here, endurance. I love that word endurance. It really highlights for me. I, I like to run. I like to run races. And the problem is, is that if uh, I ran my first marathon, I've told everybody about that. But the problem is when you run, you have to look up and find out a running plan. You ever heard like a, a, a couch potato to a marathon runner? You ever seen those? You're like, okay, how do I do this? You need help to figure out how to get off the couch and start running on Because you don't go like, hey, I'm supposed to run 26.2. I think I'll head out tomorrow for my first run, see if I can get in 26.2. You know, let's just see if I can do it. Some people have tried that. They get extremely hurt. Why? Because they've not built up their endurance. And if you try to do something without endurance, you actually will hurt yourself. You set yourself back, actually. So whenever we get into a situation where we're like, hey, the Lord's trying to produce faith in us. He's trying to increase this faith in us so that we can start to endure this race of life. But for many of us, we don't want to endure anything. We want to comfort our flesh and run away and hide. James says that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Continued effort to do or achieve something despite difficulties, failure, or opposition. That's what it means to endure. To press in and continue forward. And he says this, when you encounter trials. In other words, you're going to face them, whether you like it or not. But can you endure? Romans 12, 12 says this, be joyful in hope, patient in the affliction and faithful in prayer. That is a map already for us. When you feel a trial coming on, when you feel sin creeping up in your life, the first thing is just, I'm gonna be joyful in the hope that the Lord's gonna help me overcome. I'm gonna be patient with this affliction. I'm not gonna try to rush through it. I'm a Lord, you just, you guide my steps. The Lord is a light unto my path. Some of y'all try to run so fast out of it, you don't know where the light's at. You ever try to run at nighttime with just a flashlight? You're gonna hit a tree. (laughs) Faithful in prayer. I think it's interesting because when we start to face these, if we'll stop for just a second and realize you have been sown like a seed into the world, you have been scattered among the nations so that when you start to encounter a trial, you can find the joy in that moment because you know what's coming. You have a hope for the future. You know that the Lord has already declared your victory and you can endure that process. You can pray into that process and then the people around you go like, how the heck did you do that? I, whenever I face a trial, I have to take medicine and drink alcohol. Not me, I'm just saying that's what people say. I was like, let me phrase that out. And they're looking at you, trying to figure out, how did you not run to what comforts me? If I did, I would repent right now, but I don't. (laughs) But that's such a common thing, isn't it? We face trials and temptations. What do we do? I I just need some wine to knock that edge off. And then I need a few more glasses of wine. I need to take take a little pill so I can sleep better at night. We we were replacing the Holy Spirit with a different kind of spirit. (laughs) And it's a dangerous game that we play when we trust the things of this world to replace the things of God. There's an endurance that has to happen. What if the internal and external difficulties you face are meant to be a planting of the kingdom of God in this world? What if you looked at your trials that way? 
the thing that is facing you down right now, whether it is doubt or fear or, or finances or whatever is in front of you, it's the death of a family member or the, or just, it doesn't matter what it is. If you looked at that and said, this is my opportunity to allow for the kingdom of God to shine in my life so that everyone can see. What if we looked at them that way? Now, all of a sudden, when we consider it a joy, we consider, God, you, you deem me worthy of this to endure this. You know, whenever the, uh, whenever some of the early fathers of our faith were going through trials in the scripture, it says they, they counted it joy because they felt uh, they, they were so shocked that they were considered worthy of the gospel to suffer. We should speak, we should consider it a joy because God, you're allowing us to endure a hardship. Now this may seem backwards to you, but it just helps us to find our place as we stand in the Lord. Let me ask you this. Does your faith get tested enough to even grow? Our faith actually has to be tested. Just think of the seed that gets planted. It's not watered 24-7. It'll drown out. A little bit of water, and then it has to sit in that dirt with a scorching sun heating it up so that it begins to grow and grow and grow. So let's look at James 1, 2 through 3. It says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. I love the passion here. It says, For you know that when your faith is tested, it stirs a power within you to endure all things. Ooh, that's a good way. You know why? Because you can't, you can't do it. I'm so glad the Bible says that all trials we can, in our flesh, stand and make it through all of them. It actually doesn't say that. Don't write that down. <laughs> the scriptures tell us over and over and over again, you can't do it. You need the power of God. You need the Holy Spirit. When Jesus left, he said, it's better for you that I go because the Holy Spirit's gonna come. And when the Holy Spirit comes in you, you now have the power to withstand that trial. Boy, how about finding some joy in that? Just finding joy that you're allowed to have more of the Holy Spirit to endure what you're going through. Thank you, Lord, that I get more of your spirit to endure the test that's ahead of me. There's a theologian, his name is Douglas Moo. He says this, he's talking about perseverance. He says, it's not a meek, passive submission to circumstances, but a strong, active, challenging response in which the satisfying realities of Christianity are proven in practice. Ooh. Wouldn't it be great to prove your faith? You can it's in the practice of finding joy in every circumstance and building that endurance. And it's not just so that you can have endurance. It's, it's, it's going for a plan and for a purpose. We're gonna see here in a second that it goes on. It's for your maturity and your wholeness to be complete in Christ. We want that. That's what we want. If you say, hey, I wanna grow up and I wanna be mature in my faith, Lord, he's like, all right, I'm gonna send some trials your way that you're gonna have to endure, but you, I want you to find the joy in it. I want my presence to come. I wanna fill you with my spirit. So you're, gonna, you're like, no, 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 Lord, just, just make me really Bible smart. Just help me memorize the verses, Lord. He says, no, you're going to have to endure. And it's hard. So today I want, I want to walk you through four practices of perseverance. The four practices. Now, the reason I'm getting, I want you to be able to walk out of here with some applicable things to do in your life. Because when you read scripture, the goal is not just to read through it and get it in. It's, we're supposed to, again, meditate, think on it, allow for the words to, to get into your heart and mind so that you can begin to walk out something of faith in your life. So you can start to put it into motion and practice. So I have four practices based off this. The first one is this, it's the practice of release. You got to focus on what is within your control and release the rest. Whenever you face trials, you know what you have control of? Very little. You have control of your thoughts. You have control of your behavior. And you have control of your, and, uh, of your disciplines. That's what we get to take control of. Sometimes we try to take control of the situation. Get your hand off the situation. Just the other day, Erica and I, we, we went to Kansas City. Um, there's a church that brought us in and we were supposed to go and we're supposed to speak for two days at two hours a piece. And we're supposed to prophesy for this group of people as well. Now, I didn't grow up in the prophesying kind of church. You know what I mean? It, it doesn't come as old hat. I didn't sit at the dining room table and, and pray over nations like David did. You know what I mean? Um, that, that wasn't like, that wasn't common for us necessarily. Uh, so the point is that like, I don't have tons of history of prophesying. 
Some of you may, I I don't have a ton, but I know, man, I love it when God begins to move in my life and it happens and I trust him in it now. And it's been amazing to see God moving that way. But when you're going to a new state and somebody is asking you to come and deliver this, uh, you get a little nervous. And I'm, you know, we're flying there and I'm thinking, oh man, I don't have doubt and I don't have a lack of faith. I just have a lack of something that makes me believe, Lord, I hope you show up in this situation as I go because I don't have words right now. And he's like, just trust me. When you get in front of them with that mic, I'm going to speak. I'm like, oh, could you? I got a journal with a bunch of blank pages we could work on while we're heading there. So at least I feel like I got something, anything, Lord. I don't know how many of you have come up to situations where like God's calling you into something and you're not sure how you're going to get into it and get through it. And you, I, can't, I can't make God give me a word. I had to actually release that and say, Lord, I trust you. When my thoughts started saying like, you better figure out something. You better start thinking of it. I'm thinking of puppies and dogs and mountains and trees. I'm, I'm like, come on, Lord, I'm trying to stir up the prophetic, you know? And he's like, just release all that. Release it. And the sad part is I think about, you know, one of the, 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 the worst things that can happen for us is when we take on more than we should handle. When we watch things like we did this week about what happened in Uvalde, Texas, we immediately jump to this place of the spirit of fear and we start thinking of all the ways we could have fixed it. We should have done something. We should have, and now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, my kid's gonna be wearing a whole suit and ironproof and he's gonna have a gun and I'm gonna send him in there like that and I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy guns for all the teachers and we're gonna have landmines all across there. We're gonna build real tall fences for every school. You're like, shh. Like what, what have you just released those thoughts? Here, here's what it says in the scripture. In 2 Corinthians 10, 5, it says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So when all of those thoughts start stewing, and you know what I'm talking about, because man, most of them are on Facebook now for everybody. You know what I mean? It's just, just word vomit, everything out there because everybody needs to know. And so what, when all that starts to stir up in your mind and you can't take control of your thoughts, just stop for just a moment. Just realize I have control over this. I'm going to release that to God. He gives you the spirit of God in him, which is power, love, and a sound mind. There's a lot of people who are no longer in sound mind because fear has taken over. When these inner thoughts and desires and struggles begin to come, Jesus was talking about it in Matthew 13. He tells this parable. He says that the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed. Boy, here we are again. We are sown all out into the world, right? He sows good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. I think spiritually we, we fall asleep and we wake up with a garden full of weeds in our life. And we don't know what to do. I want to tell you, no matter what's going on during your week, stay vigilant spiritually. You need to practice a release when your mind starts getting all worked up. You know what the enemy loves to use to do that in your mind and brain? CNN, ABC, Fox, all the others. How many of you feel a sound mind as you go to bed at night after listening to the news? We should capture those thoughts, take them to the obedience in Christ, say, Lord, what do you say? The second one is the practice of response. James 1, 4 says, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. This right here is already helping me realize those trials that I'm going through, the joy that I'm supposed to receive and to find in the midst of that, It's for a plan and for a purpose. It's so that I can respond well and step into maturity and completeness, not lacking anything. How do you do this? You pray into the situation, listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying and let him finish his work in you. The very first words is let perseverance finish its work. In other words, let the Holy Spirit do what he needs to do in your life so you can make it through this. Sometimes that's repentance. Sometimes it's confession but there is a practice of release or a response that we have to have. It's a response to what the Holy Spirit says to you. So when was the last time you let yourself go through a process? Sadly, we've tried to run and flee and medicate and drink our way through a process, never gaining maturity, never gaining completeness, never allowing for our faith to be tested so that it can grow into full maturity. We have to pray that the Holy Spirit will bring us to that place. It says in 2 Peter that the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. If that's what the word of God says, you know what my favorite thing to do is just to pray back the word of God. 
because we can declare what the word of God says. And if it says that in 2 Peter, how about we pray this? Lord, you said you would rescue me from these trials. I'm willing to endure, Lord, so show me how. Boy, that could be a prayer that we just pray over and over. I don't know how to get through this, so Holy Spirit, take over. But you said in your word, you'll get me through the trial. There's a guy named Walter Wink, and he says this, because those are like serious prayers. And he's talking about intercessory prayer is spiritual defiance of what is in the way of what God has promised. It is spiritual defiance of what is in the way of what God has promised. The word of God says, you're gonna get through that trial. We just pray into that process. Lord, get me through whatever it looks like. However you want it, whatever needs to happen, it's all about you, Lord. The third one is this, it's the practice of receiving. James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. But our first, typically, like I do, I like to go to Google because Google's got all the answers. And when I can't find it there, the Lord's like, hey, you, you just wasted too much time. Sadly, the other day, I was um, just really trying to pray about messages. I try to, you know, I'm trying to get into this. And I, man, I just started Googling a bunch of videos and I looked at the watch. I was like, it's been 15 minutes. And I've been on this dumb internet trying to find a video. Maybe that would be funny enough or good enough. Cause it's like, you know what you did? And the Lord's like, Hey, you want to just ask me? I'll, I'll help you figure it out. I was like, oh. why do I always try to do things in my flesh? Lord, help me. It's the practice of receiving. Lord, give me wisdom for this situation. And just, just, I'll just take it, Lord. I'll receive it. Here's some ways you can do that. Don't withdraw and don't isolate. We try to do that with God. We try to run away from God. Why is it every time that something hard happens, we try to run from God? Instead, we should like, Lord, give me the wisdom to make it through. Second thing is to prioritize relationships with each other. Prioritize these relationships. Have a meal together. Go on a walk together. Call each other on the phone. Prioritize it. Make it important. When you are going through a trial, there's nothing better than to have someone who's already gone through one similar to yours saying, you're going to make it. You're going to be just fine. Let me prophesy into your future. If you can't do it, I'll do it for you. Number three, I'm going to say this. How about run from negative people? Some of y'all need to learn how to run from some negative people. We don't need that in our life. People who hear about your situation be like, well, I had a really bad one too. How about this? And you're like, no, no, stop. We're just getting all caught up and let's just pray into this. Let's just talk together, encouragement. And the other thing is this, you gotta ask the Lord for wisdom. You have to receive the wisdom of God and he gives it, he gives it through his word. He gives it to us in community as a group of people. He gives it to us in so many different ways. We just have to ask and receive the wisdom of God. And as we're hearing that wisdom, allow for the Holy Spirit to take that wisdom and drop it into your spirit so you know what to do because you actually have to do something with it. Wisdom isn't wisdom if you don't use it. John 16, says, I've told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. There's some wisdom. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That's the kind of scripture we have to take the wisdom of the word of God, put it into our lives and know like, listen, I'm gonna take heart because I don't care what's going on. He's overcome the world and I'm, I'm gonna get through this. I'm gonna be okay. The last practice is this, it's the practice of purpose. I want you to realize your position before and after the trial. This text that we have been reading is for a reason. James wrote this for a reason. The skeptic who watched his half brother for three and a half years do miracles and to preach and teach. And, and he felt like, man, I've just been standing on the sidelines and now, now I got to step into this. He had fear, but he just let it go. He started to realize, maybe I still have a purpose in this. He can look back and bring encouragement to others who felt like they've missed it. Acknowledge the growth that you've had from past trials and past struggles. Prepare yourself for the next one because there's a plan and a purpose. It is actually to grow your faith into full maturity so you can be fully complete in the Lord. What's so difficult is watch so many people struggle after trial after trial, never growing in faith, never growing in maturity. And I'm like, man, if you would just take one of these, 
one of them and allow for the Lord to just speak to your life. If you would step into it and be able to say like, I'm going to find what the Lord is trying to do in this situation, then maybe just maybe you would mature just a little bit more. So the next one that came, you're getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And I thought of it this way. When I was in high school, we'd do two a days. You do football. Man, that heat, it's just scorching and you're sweating. You feel like you're dying on the inside. But guess what? You know, if I can get through this, then tomorrow I'm going to be even better. Because the endurance and the building of my, my actual physical body is getting stronger and stronger. And the next year that comes around, the two days come around, you're like, man, I'm afraid it was coming because it's going to hurt. But I have some joy in it. I'm going to go in there. I'm going to give it all I've got because I've been through something like this before. And sometimes it takes an older senior to look down at a freshman and say, you're not going to die. You're going to be okay. They'll give us water in a minute. And some of us need to get to a place in our life. I don't care how old or how young where you start to realize I've been through some things. I've been through some seasons that were really hard, but I have found a purpose in each one of them. And I want you to look around you and see, can you find some piece of joy for your life? Because the trials will never stop until you die. And can you find a way so that knowing that you have been sown into this world for a purpose and for a plan, and it's so that someone else can look at you and go, that kingdom of God is pretty powerful if they can make it through that. It's the practice of purpose. James rounds out this little piece for us in the last few verses, and he says this, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not, to, not, should, should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Man, I was thinking about what we've been talking about so far, and when I hit this piece, I was like, how do you teach that? And I felt like the Lord showed me that it's really, you have two choices. You can choose you and your flesh, or you can choose the Lord. Don't be double-minded. Choose the Lord every single time. That's how you grow into faith. That's how you grow into your maturity. That's how you can find that joy because he'll show you where it's at. Whether it's in more of his spirit, more wisdom, more relationships, more lunches, whatever it looks like, he will help you find the joy. And listen, joy in this context is not some silly attempt at like a foolishness to just generate some sort of happiness in the midst of a trial. It, what we're talking about is joy is a choice in wisdom to know that God is going to use this trial for your benefit. The trial isn't good, but he's going to make it good for your benefit. A lot of bad things have happened to, to people in this room. What happened to you was not good, but what the Lord did in you and through you after that has been for your good. If we trust him and step into all that he has for us. These are the practices, these four different practices. If you would just begin to apply some aspect in your life, just one of them, take one of them and just meditate on these scriptures and say, Lord, pray back his word. Help me to see your presence. Help me to see your spirit in the midst of all of these trials. Help me to lean into this and find the joy in my life so that I can worship you in the midst of a trial. I loved it because the Israelites this morning, I was thinking about this. I was like, man, if I had a shofar, I still wouldn't blow it. But I'm just saying, I'd be like, we should blow it, you know? Because I thought what was so beautiful is that you look at the armies of the Lord when they would go into battle. You know what they did? They didn't shout at the enemy and make fun of them. They cried out to the Lord and began to worship. But the worshipers went first. Why? Because our worship carries us in the presence of God through every single trial and adversity. And sometimes the soldiers had to do the fighting and sometimes the Lord did it for them. You just don't know until you set your foot out there and go for it. We just worship our way through every trial and see what happens. And Jesus... You know, everything's about Jesus. Jesus is our example. He lived this out. He came fully God into a body, into the flesh, so that we have an example, so we could see him live it out as a human, as a man, and we can look at him as an example for us and how we should live. And he did it so beautifully. At the end of his life, you see it in Luke twenty two forty two, 42, where he's wrestling with all the things that are about to happen, he's going through a very difficult trial. He's dealing with the internal and the external trials of this situation. He's knowing he's about to die on a cross. And he says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Every trial we face, we say, Lord, it's not my will, but yours be done. So this morning, I want you to stand up with me. I'm going to have our prayer team. They're going to stand down here at the front. As Jesus was our example, it's all about his will, not yours. And so I just, I just want to say this. If, if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, make today the day. 
You're never gonna make it through another trial until the spirit of God resides in you to carry you through. Oh, you may have made it through, but you didn't really make it through. Some of you know what I'm saying. Parts of us get left behind in all the battles and the trials and we, we lose ourselves in all the difficulties of our day. But I, I know many of you in this room who are solid believers, who the Lord has carried you through and you are better today than you were yesterday because of what you endured. You know the Lord better today. You're stronger today than you've ever been. That can be you. Give your life to Jesus, man. If you're going through a struggle or a difficulty and you just need somebody on this prayer team to lay hands on you, to pray with you, to encourage you, man, they might even prophesy over you. They're just gonna get an immediate word, who knows? But I'm telling you now, come down and let us pray with you today. Let us encourage you. But if you were in this room today, my goal and my hope is that when you walk out of this room, you are going to be changed. You, you look at the scripture differently. You're gonna, you're gonna meditate on the scriptures. You're gonna allow for these practices and these things of life to be able to be played out so that you can grow into full maturity in your faith. So I'm gonna pray this over you. So Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you for our opportunity to come together and just to worship you. You were here today and we're just so thankful that we got to be in your presence and to receive. So Lord, I pray that your word will not come back void, but that God, it would settle on our hearts. I pray that if anyone in this room is going through difficult circumstances, difficult trials, I pray for, for just the outpouring of your spirit today in their life, that they would just receive more of the Holy Spirit to carry them through into full maturity, into completeness. I pray that, Lord, we walk out of here willing to lean into all of these trials, Lord, that we're willing to, to face them, Lord, and just to let go and allow for you to move in our lives, and we just trust you. So, God, as we go, be with us carry us through. In Jesus' name, amen.